welcome back. And uh, we still continue the conversation around Bola Ahmed Tinubu's choice of Kashim Shatima, Senator uh, Shatima, who's a former governor of Borneo State. And um, the choice has um, ruffled a number of feathers, especially amongst uh, the Christian community. They have been reacting, saying that it's a no-no to have a Muslim president and a Muslim vice presidential cand candidate, even though they have at least 16 other political parties. Uh, but there's a lot of attention on the ruling party and what uh, it decided to do with its choice for president and vice presidential uh, candidate. Reverend Joseph Hayam, the country director of Global Peace Foundation, is also in the leadership of the Christian Association of Nigeria. Great to have you join us, Reverend Hayam. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Yeah. Excellent. And I'm sure that, um, like a number of Christian leaders also, too, you have your thoughts on how and uh, uh, Kashim Shatima has emerged as the candidate of the all, vice presidential candidate of the All Progressives uh, con Congress. What, what, what were your initial thoughts? There has been anxiety and speculation about this. Finally, yesterday, Bola Tinebu confirmed the fears and concerns that Nigerians and especially the Christian community have expressed about the need for balance in choice of his deputy. As much as we recognize that he has the liberty and right to decide who deputize for him, one thing that Ahmed Tinubu and his team must not forget is that one of the cries today in Nigeria is nepotism. The combination of those who lead us, the combination of even the security architecture of Nigeria has called for great concern. And after all cries and appeal that, look, let's find a way to unite this country. Let's find a way to balance this country. And he makes that choice. He simply confirmed to Christians saying that, look, I'm not a listening person. So if I have decided my interest comes first, it's not what you say. And that's simply what I understand. Before now, about a fortnight ago, the Christian Association of Nigeria re, uh, released uh, a, a, a press statement against the possibility of a choice of a Muslim Muslim ticket by any political party in the country. And they will talk to be against even the choice of Christian Christian or Muslim Muslim. What is the stand of the association this morning? Has anything changed? The stand of the association remains the same. We have advised all the political parties, not restricted to APC, because I think people are over flogging the, the matter about APC. That look, Nigeria of today has a lot of issues of trust. Yes, you may use 1993 as an example, but at that time, we do not live in this kind of suspicion. That's this fear, this anxiety, this challenge we are facing today. And to heal the wound of today, let there be balance in the combination of those who lead. As a peace practitioner, one thing we do in every community we go is to allow every voice to be heard. Because you can't solve people's problems when you isolate them. You can't solve people's problems when you don't bring them to the table together. But we are having a situation where in a country some people believe that we can lead you whether you like it or not. We can lead you whether you belong to it or not. And I think that is where we have concern. But all the same, we are in a multi-party democracy. Bola Ahmed Nubu and his APC have chosen what they want to choose. It is left for us to decide to eat the kind of food that is good for the unity of Nigeria, not a food that divides Nigeria. All right. Um, I, I, I've listened to a number of religious uh, leaders and, um, you know, in the run-up to next year's general elections. And the, 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 the conversation has gone from uh, make sure you go register your PVCs uh, to the choice of the candidates, what they, what they say, the quality of who should become Nigeria's next president uh, at the sub-national uh, level with the states. But if you stick with the president, are you, are you, are you comfortable with religious leaders um, picking candidates for their congregants, saying this is who you should vote for next year? 
Well, Khan has not picked candidate for her congregant, but Khan is guiding her congregants to understand where and how to do or to act in situations that we find ourselves. After all, every day the congregants run to us and cry of attacks, of killing, of insecurity, of lack of food, of lack of job, and so on and so forth. Khan receives complaints from her congregants every day about lack of listening by certain government. And why do people in leadership refuse to listen to people when they take certain decisions with impunity and don't care how you feel? And this is what we are saying. So Khan is not in any way trying to do something new. Khan is just solving that old problem she has been facing, receiving complaints from congregants. No, congregants, you always come and complain to us, and because of your complaint, we raise voice out and tell the nation and all the political parties that Nigeria at this time needs unity. Nigeria at this time needs everybody to be on the table. Nigeria needs at this time to have everybody recognized and respected as a stakeholder in nation building. But if some people feel we are not qualified, we don't have what it takes to do, uh, then uh, there's no reason to fight them. We have not said it, so we know where they belong, we know their position. If they don't listen to advice when they've not yet won election, will they listen to you when they win? All right. Uh, Reverend Hayab, what would you say is the position of religious bodies uh, in the electoral process of the country, especially as Nigeria warms up towards uh, the general elections in 2023? Uh, well, I don't know if I understand your question correct. I would say that there is a high level of knowledge and desire to participate in political activity or let's say in the process of choosing leaders in Nigeria. Because the biggest challenge Nigerians is facing, Nigeria is facing today is poor leadership. So religious leaders begin to understand that. In the past, people who ignorantly do not understand will say, no, you are pastors, you have no business to do with politics, you have no business to do, it's concentrate on your pulpit. Hey, brother, it is the state that approves the budget that involves the church, the mosque, and every other religious uh, organization and religious uh, followers. It is the government, sorry, that approves our budget. It is the government that comes up with policy to govern us. If we don't have interest in how we are being governed, then we'll be governed by parent people who will not even care how we feel. Our rights will be infringed. So because we want to live peacefully, we want to live as free citizens, we have to be involved. I may not seek political office, and none of the current leaders will seek political office, or the other religious leaders may seek political office, but we will guide our people right and speak to the conscience of those in power to know that we are watching and we are following and we understand what is going on. And I think this is what is playing out, that more voices are there saying, go out and get your voters card, go out and even join the political parties, go out and be part of it, and then telling the political structures or parties that, look, people are watching, people are interested in what you do, so do what will unite the people, do what will lift the people arise, don't do what will further segregate the people, don't do what will confirm the fear of nepotism that we have seen in the current leadership, to be as if it is true. Because, you know, among the different respect groups, people do come around and say, you know, there's a hidden agenda. I don't believe in that kind of a thing unless you prove that there's a hidden agenda. Now, at least, I have been doubting since the announcement has been made, we know that he felt there is no Christian in his party that knows and is qualified and have the pedigree to be a deputy. Uh, you know, it's just quite funny. Because when we talk deeper about this conversation, one of the questions we ask ourselves is that if you are talking about competency, there are three things you must know. Number one, I and my wife can be competent, but it is not good enough for the two of us to dominate affairs of the country. Our competency does not translate into that no other person can serve. Other people too can serve. Number two, when we are even talking about competence, the Christians in the North are, not, are among the first A grade. So someone cannot even talk to us about competence. Talk to us, please. Say something else. But you know, because this is politics, people can manipulate words and say what they want to say. But for the Christians, we have seen, we have known, and what is left is for us to act accordingly and go to people who want to unite Nigeria, not go to people who want to continue to remain uh, or segregate and think that others are not watching. When, when you say act accordingly, um, does it mean that... Um uh, frankly speaking, the, the Christian Association of Nigeria or any of its affiliates um, will say to congregants, uh, this is how we should go because they haven't listened to us in the choice of how 
um, we, you, we, you should choose a president or vice presidential candidate, one Christian, one Muslim, then we are going to ask you any party that hasn't done that has violated this rule we have put forward as a religious body. So don't vote for them. You, you, you think Khan will take that sort of position in the future? Well, Khan leaders are speaking about this subject with one voice. And I know that this decision is not new. We have already informed all the political parties that we are not going with people who think we don't have a role to play in the administration. Or Christian politicians do not have a role to play in the administration. So what we simply understand here now is we are gradually reducing the number of our choices because some have shown that we don't belong, they don't need us, we have no role to play. So we go and look at the other choices that are left and see who is willing to unite Nigeria, is willing to accommodate everybody, is willing to carry everybody along, who wants to build Nigeria with every Nigeria. Then we will go in there. Reverend Joseph, um, I, I like to speak from the perspective of uh, some who would say that Christianity would always preach tolerance. And tolerance would be like you tolerate others regardless of their religious uh, background and what have you, especially when they are not going against the tandem of the things that will favor a nation and uh, as a result of that, the electorate. Uh, should it matter the religion that you know presidential or let me say public uh, office seekers are uh, practice in as much as they would abide by the rules of the land and deliver on promises? I wish that your question is what we are seeing in Nigeria. But you and I and every other Nigerian is aware that in the last seven years, we've been passing through a lot of pain. Christians have cried out about killings among their faithfuls maltreatment of their faithful, kidnapping of their faithful, burning of churches of their faithful, attacks in their places of worship. So many things that you can mention. And one of the key things we keep saying is when such decisions are taken to address those things, they are taken and they are skewed one-sided. They are not taken with the view of another person. They are not taken with the eyes of another person. They are not taken with the opinions of the other group, and that's the Christian group. So Christians felt that we should have a leadership that will, if in the situation we have now, we are facing this terrible thing. Imagine a situation where the president, the vice president, the senate president, the speaker, all come from the same faith. Then we'll have a situation in a country where certain decisions will be taken without. Because, you see, theologically, our position and understanding about tolerance differs from what I see happening around as tolerance. Because we go to tolerance with respect and acceptance. But there are many people who come to discuss with us. They don't come to discuss with us with respect and acceptance. They see us that they are just barely listening to us. Because whether we like it or not, what they want must go. So where do you preach tolerance and where do you emphasize that your tolerance when you are in that system, when you have such situation? I must say, probably you've not been in a situation where your loved one is being killed or has been with bandits for months and you keep calling government 1,000 times and there's nothing they can do for you. Then you will begin to talk about tolerance because go to that woman who has lost her daughter, lost her son, and keep that. Then you tell her this tolerance thing. Tolerance is a fine word and we need to practice it, but is it what we are saying today in Nigeria? So the Christian community is one of the most tolerant groups, but I think our tolerance is not weakness, that is our tolerance, uh, ignorance. So our to because I'm tolerant does not mean that, okay, you won't put me as part of the decision makers of the nation. Uh, no, that's not tolerance. That's, that's an abuse of my tolerance. All, all, all right, uh, Reverend Hayab, uh, great. And I, I'm sure it's the same sort of um, discussion a lot of people want to think about it, uh, when you think about ethnicity too, because um, uh, they put in the same they put in the same basket uh, ethnicity and religion in the choice choices we make for uh, political leadership. You, you, you think we'll, we'll also get to that point also too, where where the person comes from won't be a matter of real debate. It'll just be a, a case of um, um, if you can do the job, and if and if you think that that is possible, how soon do you think we can get to, get there as an electorate? in looking beyond uh, where the person comes from or what faith he, he or she professes to? Successful businesses all over the world, including government, go for the best brand. But even in the best brand, 
they will also have this provision that let there be inclusiveness. So you go for the best brain, but also you give room for inclusiveness so that you don't have the best brain in one home, in one tribe, in one religion, in one color, in one form of identity. That's exactly what we are saying. We agree that the best brain to rule Nigeria, but it must also be an inclusive government. A government, however intelligent it is, without inclusiveness, is a weak government and cannot deliver the good. All right. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> we've had a lot of Nigerians before now talk about the fact that Fulanese from the north always had uh, a very great hand when it comes to the leadership of the country. But maybe for the first time in a very long time, maybe the first time ever, I stand corrected, a Kanuri man is going to be running alongside a Yoruba man, uh, still talking about the possibility of people thinking in terms of ethnicity while choosing the leaders in the country. Um, how do you see Nigerians in the year 2023? No, I think you probably don't know the story. Where do you place Baba Gana Kinkibe? I beg your pardon. Where did you place Baba Gana Kinkibe? Is he not a Kanuri man? I'm Who's just. Wrong I, with that, Abiola? He is a Kanuri man. All right. So let's get our history facts clear. That's what I said earlier on. When has a that... man or a ham man from Kaduna State also be called upon to be a vice president? When has a Bachama man or a, a Nunguda man called to be a vice president? So when you see, I'm just answering your question because you said that this is the first time a Kanuri man. No, no. That was what I said. Thank you. As I said, I stand corrected, which you've come to my okay. aid. Uh, not because I didn't know where uh, King Ibe came from, but the truth was uh, he didn't eventually become the vice president of the country. Oh, uh, but this is, but this is, this is a new, one so moment, Reverend Hayat, one, one moment, sir. Yeah. One moment, sir. But this is a new dispensation. There's a new possibility on the block, which could really come to the fore. Uh, what do you see happening, for instance, if uh, a man from the northeastern part of the country, where many people have argued that has never presented, uh, presented a president, perhaps a vice presidential uh, candidate, so to speak, and uh, coming with the southwestern, uh, in, a man from the southwest coming together, would this satisfy any form of uh, yearnings from that part of the country? That's actually my question. Well, let's not forget that, number one, in, in Nigeria, we have issue, we have different identities that play a very key role in certain things we do in Nigeria. We have the regional identity, we have the religious identity, we have also the tribal identity, we have other identities that you can add them to. But those four three are very key. The, the uh, regional identity, the religious identity, and then the tribal identity. They are very key to what we do. And in this country, we must open up and allow every Nigerian to feel belong and allow every Nigerian to feel respected and allow every Nigerian to feel equal. One of the uh, what we keep hearing around is people feel some people in Nigeria are second class citizens. And one of the reasons we are insisting and fighting to ensure that we change that narrative. There is no one in this country that is a citizen. We are all equal before the law. We are all equal in everything. And there's no one part of the that has capacity to other. Though people may claim to others have more Options, but not there are no in other. There are too many options. So, have you seen the one that we talk about? So, you blindly just this picture as if people are not divided, they cannot be, they cannot deliver. It's actually just just them and take them to their. It's, well, that's what we we didn't. But that when the democracy is most. All right. Uh, no, it is we're, we're so, yes, yes, we're, we're yes, going yes. to have to end the call with Reverend Hayab and call back um, mm -hmm. see if we can pick up um, uh, from where he stopped uh, because of the quality of the connection. But great point Reverend Hayab making Absolutely. and always, um, always a great spot when you hear his analysis on the issues, well-rounded, especially around um, governance and who and how people should yes. think and vote. And it's interesting that the, the Christian leadership had had talks with all of the political parties in saying, this is where we need to go as a people. I yeah. guess it's the, back to the, the old saying that you first of all will crawl before you begin to walk. 
and uh, being realistic about say, exactly say, what say we Say for have. some children, I'll go and hold the chair and get up. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, you know, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Reverend Hyatt, you know, I always love to get his perspective to uh, whatever issue that has to do with the country and how he's been a formidable voice to listen to. Uh, we still join him just uh, in a moment. We want to ensure that the network is as clear enough so we can hear him clearly. Uh, talking about uh, the issue mm. of uh, religion and tribe and what have you, mm. uh, the question, I, I didn't really get it answered to possibility of the, uh, in the emergence mm. of uh, you know, Tinumbu and as president, perhaps even Shetima now vice president, if it will calm the nerves of those people from the northeastern part of the country who mm. really say that they've also been marginalized. Although their voice, some would argue, has not been as loud as that of the people from the southeast who uh, have always come out to say this is what we want to do, we want for, for ourselves as people from that region. Uh, we also want to hear uh, his perspective to that also. And remember, we always love to know what you're thinking on any of the uh, topics we keep doing because you're the reason for us uh, to bring such topics here. Go on our social media handles, drop your comments, questions, and suggestions for us so that we can get your feel on any of these uh, that we're talking about. This morning is about uh, Muslim Muslim ticket for the APC and the choice of uh, Mr. Shatima to be the vice presidential candidate on that platform of the APC and what this could bring to the table for the party moving forward. Right, right. So we'll, we'll see if we can get back to it and however, come back from that quick break, but we'll go for a quick break. But um, very, very importantly, the point he, say, he makes about, because a lot of people down south uh, don't realize the numbers of ethnic group. When we hear 250 ethnic groups, conservative figure, make, make up of this country, People rule Yoruba, Hausa, Igbo, Igbo, and they throw in the Fulanese now. Mm. And then forget you about 260 or thereabout. And they're not just in the south. They're scattered even in the north. So even in the north, you've got minority groups, some of them he mentioned, and who, who are, are also clamoring also too for a say in government, which is why this ethnic um, debate we often have mm -hmm. Uh, is a Pandora box you don't want to open mm -hmm. because you suddenly realize that many of the things, especially in the South, people say, oh, this Fulani people. I said, no, you know, yeah. there are no Fulani people in Bono State, for example, you know, uh, so they're not even making up makeup of the Boko Haram, which interestingly, yeah. uh, more of the Kanuris, where uh, as a majority group together with even Chiboka as, as an ethnic group. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe some of the history we need to go back to, there, especially as a country, mm -hmm. should also understand the geography of this nation. Uh, many times. I mean, I do try. When I hear names, for example, I, I can guess exactly what state Where they're from. Uh, they're from. <laughs> even the tribe, especially from the Middle Belt, uh, the Tivan, the <laughs> Indoma people, and the Jukun people. So those yeah, are big discussions we should have. Uh, yes. Yeah. But it looks like we have Reverend Hyatt back now. Oh, so nice to have you back. Reverend, so nice to have you back on the program. Thank you. And at this point in time, I'd like for you to talk about the kind of sermons you're looking forward to hearing from, uh, you know, the Christian part, the people from the Islam, uh, the Muslim part, and then even the traditionalists, because many people are very worried about the 2023 general elections. They feel uh, that the, the insecurity as well as maybe uh, the pattern of voting and all kinds of things that can be going on. What kind of sermon are you looking forward to? Or the ones that you're also preaching that can help unite the country towards the 2023 general elections? Okay. One, uh, one of the sermons we have actually been preaching is Nigerians should trust God and work together to ensure that 2023 elections come to pass. The fear that the election will not happen shouldn't even be, because when you do a little reflection of previous history, you will agree with me that most time when we are running towards election, there is anxiety, people would think it will not happen, and it will come to pass. So let's work towards ensuring that 2023 election comes to pass. Number two, we want people to go and exercise their franchise. People have learned lessons in the past seven years. Is it a good lesson? Did we become more united as Nigeria or divided? 
Was there peace? Was there good governance? Were people engaged and employed as promised? The people were people sacked from work or they retain their job. So these are many other people will look at and decide where they go. And then another part we are bringing is this, this conversation we are having today. We are looking for leaders who want to work with every segment of Nigeria, respecting them and allowing their voice to be heard. We are not looking for leaders who feel we don't care about you, we don't care what you feel, we don't bother whether you like us or you don't like us, we will be because we are the ones in charge. No. We have tried that and it never worked. I'm from Kaduna State. One of the places that they used to use as an example that Muslim Muslim ticket work, let's ask ourselves an honest question. What happened in the last four years? Is Kaduna State the place, the story from here every day, is it the kind of good story we want for our country? Is it the kind of story we want for the future of our children? So let's be honest to ourselves. And when we come back to our faith, every faith teaches our followers to be fair, to be just to everybody. Is there justice? Is there fairness in what we are doing? And I think that will decide the kind of voting that's going to happen in 2023. And, and, and it's something that uh, people would, uh, you know, would need to really think about. Um, help us understand. You, you, you said, uh, Reverend Hayab, that um, in the run-up to the party's choices of who their presidential candidates uh, will be, you had discussions. Uh, uh, the, that's Khan and the PFN had discussions. No, Khan is one group. Good. So oh. PFN is just one arm of Khan. Oh, great, great. So oh. there's nothing like Khan and PFN. Oh, oh Once right. Khan is involved, PFN is in there, Catholics are there, CCN are there, and mm -hmm. all the other groups. So once you call Khan, there's nothing like Khan and PFN. Good, good. So what, what, was, this, what was the summary of um, the discussions you had, and um, you had, especially, especially with the political parties, what, what was the summary? The summary simply is that because Nigeria is in a tense situation, there is so much suspicion and division, do everything you will do to unite Nigeria by coming up with candidates that will reflect the different interests that Nigerians will have. That means if the president is north, the vice can be south. If the president is south, the vice should be north. If the president is Christian, the vice should be Muslim. If the most president is Muslim, the vice should be Christian. And I think the president of Khan said this in clear terms. And that's where we stand. Reverend Hayer, let's um, move into the mind of an average electorate today and see what they should be looking forward to in who they should vote for. And this is uh, moving slightly, slightly away from our ethnicity or religion at this point in time. We've had elections in this country, first, second, third, fourth, fourth republic, and we still seem to be struggling with how we've been able to choose our leaders. What are those things that electorates should be pushing for um, now in terms of maybe um, uh, mapping out uh, their own people's manifesto to be presented to political parties for them to get to where they're looking forward to beyond 2023. What should the people be doing? The electorate are actually looking for a leader who would deliver the goods and a leader who will unite them. If you can deliver the good and unite, the electorate will go with you. But if you claim you want to deliver, but you are dividing them, it's like you are going to build roads for all, but we cannot fly the roads. You are going to build school for all, but our children cannot go to the school. So we need a leader who will deliver the goods and unite the people. If I want to summarize it, so the electorate are not really confused. I think Nigerians need to really know this, that sometimes we over say things about what we read on social media. Can is a rural organization. They should operate at the local government, state, and national level, but her people are from the grassroots. So we listen to what our people in the grassroots feel, what they want, and how they will see things happening. So it's not just about some holistic conversations around the cities and on the media. And so what, when I speak to you, I'm not speaking my own view. I'm speaking the feelings of that local man in the street of Kuminjato in Java local government. I'm speaking the feelings of that street man in the street of Saminaka in Lere local government. And I'm also speaking about that local man in the street of Sangha who will call me and say, Reverend Haya, what are you people doing? Are you telling us that there are no competent Christians in Nigeria? So I'm not speaking about Probably Reverend Haya will say no problem. 
But I understand that these people you think they don't know, they know and they care. Reverend Hayep, I asked the question uh, because of the pattern that we've seen since I can remember in, you know, in terms of electorates and the, the, the way and manner they behave during elections. And I'm talking about none other thing than vote buying or vote selling. Where you have a buyer, you must be looking forward to someone who's willing to sell. So the politicians are willing to pay you money to vote for them, but they pay you when you collect and you vote. If you don't vote for them, then with the Electoral Act and the way INEC is working, they may not have the votes in their favor. It has to be something you do with your conscience. Where do we start to address the, the mind of the electorate who will sell the vote uh, for a pot of porridge for four years? Honestly, thank you very much for this particular question because this is a very sad experience that we have, we've been having in Nigeria. But you cannot explain this without looking at why are people selling their votes. The political class deliberately have impoverished the people. The political class have exposed the people to lack, to danger, and to fear. And so now when it is time for election, they will come around and use their money to buy people because people are scared, people are hungry, people are poor. They will now collect a small money and sell their votes. Well, as can, especially in Kaduna State, we've been going around communities to sensitize Christians, to tell them that you, your vote, if you sell your vote for 30,000, let's assume they will give you that amount, which I know they will not. Put together 30,000 for a whole four years. That means the amount you are having per day is not even up to 200 naira. Is that all your life? So we are doing our best, and we have been calling on our colleagues all over the other states to do the same. Because people just need little education to do what is right. I can give you an example. In previous election in Kaduna State, even state conducted elections that sometimes people think can be manipulated, when such effort were done in certain parts of Kaduna, the people insist and stood their ground and get the candidate they want to win. This fact that they have been enforcing candidates on them in the past, the people refuse to give in. So we've made some success in this area and we will continue. We may not change everything 100% now, but I can tell you that we've gone beyond 60% now. And we can go for that to 80, 90%. And probably in the future, nobody will sell his vote again. So some of those people give their money and they don't get it. Even in the last primaries, we talked to many of those who went as delegates. And so this story, they are saying that money was shared. There were delegates who refused to collect the money. They are not telling that part of the story. And there are delegates who collect the money, but they didn't vote for those people because they felt it is our money. You've just stolen our money and you are sharing. So you can continue to do that. So we are making some progress. And I believe we will reach there if more efforts are. The only problem we have is we come with this idea of sensitizing people much closer to election, not long before election. But I must also comment, INEC, that now that we have up to six, seven, six months before election, let's hope that more sensitization will continue until election and we'll have a less vote buying during the next election. Well, I'm, I, we, it's a general wish also, too, even from, from the media. You, you know, so, Reverend Hayab, but this endemic poverty, which is linked directly to um, the electoral fraud, which you just talked about, is also linked to the high levels of insecurity. Uh, around the country. You know that uh, a number of dailies, uh, I think Daily Trust and I can't remember the other daily, put up um, uh, according to a source how much money has been obtained from terrorists uh, just from the Kaduna rail attack, over 800 million naira. Yeah, yeah. What would you say in terms of what you expect the candidates to answer? The, the very important questions as we run the 2023 uh, presidential election do you think they should answer in helping us understand just well, exactly what is going on? You see, when leaders do what is required of them constitutionally, things will be solved. Number one, it is expected a leader responsibility constitutionally is to protect lives and properties. If the lives of Nigerians becomes very important to the leaders, and they are protecting our lives. Bandits will not kidnap our children. 
terrorists will not deny our sleep. So we, ca we will no longer pay the ransom we are paying. Neither will we run away from our farm and don't go to farm because we are fair to be killed. We may not get money from the leaders. They may not give us any money, but because we are having that freedom, we have security. We will become economically strong enough to meet the needs of our children. We are not asking our leaders to do too much. We are asking them to do what the Constitution says. The Constitution simply requires that you protect lives and properties, and Constitution requires that you allow me the freedom. Because with freedom, I will think, I will plan, I will strategize, I will invest, or I will walk through the farm to get food. But today we are having this poverty because our leaders are not protecting us. Neither are they protecting our properties. A man who has served for 35 years as a civil servant and retired and built a house in the village, and in the night bandits come or terrorists come, destroy his house, burn everything, he has no other source to rebuild. What do you expect him? about his children, his grandchildren who used to come and stay with him. He is not just the only person you have inflicted pains and poverty on. You've inflicted pains and poverty to a very large number of people. So the primary thing we need from government is let them just protect lives and properties. And then the other thing is corruption. If government block all sorts of leakages and ensure that money is not going to private pockets but goes for the service of the people, because when it comes to construction of road, everybody will benefit. When you build school, everybody will benefit. When you build hospital, so block where they will steal money and then provide all those services, hospitals, schools, roads, and everything that makes life sweet. Okay. Nigerians are not lazy. The people that represent are not lazy. Mm. But they are only having challenge with poor leadership, leaders that are not protecting them and are exploiting division to use it to continue to impoverish them. And that's even why the choice of this Muslim Muslim ticket, because when you use the vision, you can continue to exploit people. And oh. there is nothing more than to give than what I've said. Because, okay, let's bring something that will create uh, confusion among them. They will be fighting Muslim Muslim ticket, and then the real thing will not be discussed. Reverend Hayab, there's no point having this discussion without uh, taking a look at the electoral umpire itself. Uh, an independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. What's your view of this body towards the general elections? Do you have as much faith in, in, in needs to uh, really deliver on free, fair, credible, and acceptable uh, election uh, across the board? Uh, oh, okay, we lost touch with yeah, him. Lost connection with oh, my Hayab. goodness. Reverend Hayab, uh, that question, I, I hope you're able to answer it before the end of the show, because in all of these, if the electoral umpire isn't trusted or isn't empowered enough to deliver mm -hmm. on, on an election that would be all satisfying to stakeholders, then that would be another thing entirely. So I hope that it gets around within a minute or two before yeah. we sign out on the program today. Uh, absolutely. No, absolutely. I, look, I look, forward, look forward to hearing what he has to say. The electoral body, I was discussing with someone some days ago, I said the electoral body, that's INEC, has um, in the, in the uh, value chain of the electoral process, democratic experience we've had in the last, let's, let's, let's say this fourth republic, I know what they keep saying is the, is the military people, when they are going for the last time, they will yeah. they go, they will say, this is First Republic, they will remove this, this is Second Republic. So this Fourth Republic, after the military handed back to civilians, they have um, done the most, I think, because they, they began from the very base, Scratch. you know, because I mean, when Maurice Wu was an ex chairman, it was so bad, it was ballot stuffing, there was everything, mm -hmm. but somehow they've, you know, crawled their way to the top to the point now that INEC even boasts that one day we Nigerians could even have electronic thumb printing, which will have the entire ele electoral process electronically. So I, I think that when you think about where INEC was back in the days where you even had a seven, you even had a president who came in and said, the election that brought me into office did not even meet local standards. Well, it was flawed. Just flawed. flawed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were the words. No, it did not meet local standards, what he said. And, and, and afterwards, he went on to reform the process, which we now have INEC to deal yeah. with. We need the electoral electorate to step up the game also to just like INEC. It's where, very, very important. Uh, I mean, look what happened in Sri Lanka, you know, where people oh. will know that, ah, if you elected into office, you owe the people more than your life and your blood. You mm -hmm. make, make sure if it doesn't work, that's the door. You know, it's not a picnic. You just go. Yeah. Raja Park, the park sir, will tell you the way it is uh, at this point in time because, uh, I mean, both of them, the prime minister as well as president, ha 
how to resign. In spite of that, uh, the people in Sri Lanka, if Sri Lanka still insist on occupying till they leave. And that's the way it is. Uh, that we were able to, as electorate, go vote our conscience and not vote uh, bread or, or butter or some 2,000 naira to buy nothing uh, for four years and just jettison the future of our children for just two-day meal that wouldn't even get anywhere. Uh, so uh, I think if we have to uh, see the, what the Electoral Act has been able to provide the uh, electoral body to work with, uh, from now even beyond and looking forward to some amendments that will help uh, the law also to be able to encourage, uh, you know, clarity, credibility, acceptability and what have you in terms of electoral process. Uh, we're looking forward to Nigeria getting to a place in the Committee of Nations where we can say proudly that elections really reflect the wishes of the people, not just what uh, some people behind the scenes will put together. I think that's one dream that many Nigerians, I'm, I'm, I might have to say I'm part of them, uh, have and uh, we do hope that it's something that we'll live to see and enjoy uh, in years to come. Uh, I'm not sure that every high up is coming back at this yeah. point in time. I really want him to answer the question, but I hope that we'll be able to connect with him someday soon to be able to react in that regard. Yeah, so it's a rolling conversation, so we'll, we'll speak with them. Uh, hopefully, when the deadline is up, we can have then the entire list of the presidential candidates and their vice presidential candidates. We'll come have that omnibus this conversation about all of the parties and just what their chances are on news of. Thank you very much, everyone, on this uh, public holiday for joining in, finding time. Well, you, you don't have a choice. We're number one. <laughs> because they say so. So because you say so. Because they say so, so to speak. So we thank you so much for being part of the program today. It promises to be a fantastic week. It's your holiday. We're glad to be busy for you. Continue to make us a choice. I will promise to serve you better. Enjoy your day. Meet. I'm still waiting for me to know if they have me to, to speak. <laughs> I hope they come. I get the rays I hear again in Lagos. Get your wipers working, your tires, everything that you have to use to make your car safe on the road for others and for yourself as well. Please ensure that safety is our watchword. I'm sure we did wish you a beautiful day. And I am our Obo. You watch us for any guy you see walking on your street with two different <laughs> pairs of shoes. Let me see those shoes again. They <laughs> actually look alike. Yeah. Just look out for it and then. <laughs> Urashush, everyone. Wahiri, yeah? Wahiri, everyone. <laughs>